Hey, this is four-time Black Belt World Champion Dominika Obelanite. If you guys are looking to level up your jiu-jitsu game with awesome jiu-jitsu courses on mindset, strategy, and beyond, make sure that you guys check out BGJ Mental Models Premium. I myself have a course up there, so make sure you guys check it out. Let's get you guys on that next step in your jiu-jitsu journey. Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 230. I'm Steve Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach, and I'm happy to be joined again by my favorite old bastard, Mike Mahaffey. How's it going, Mike? I am doing awesome, Steve. How are you, my friend? I am also doing good. Just a quiet weekend over here, have a, a little pocket to record, and I thought, you know what? We've Got a lot of listener questions recently about injuries, injury prevention, grappling safely, staying competitively into your uh, later years. And I thought, I know the guy to talk to about that. The guy who literally wrote the book on old bastard jujitsu, Mr. Mike Mahaffey, who better to talk to about injury prevention than you, uh, sir? You are too, too kind. I haven't written the book yet. It's actually, honestly, it's in progress. <laughs> it should be. Well, you have done a lot of media and seminars and even made a course on this topic. So for those who aren't familiar with your work, do you want to maybe just swing a quick intro for yourself here? Yeah, I'm a uh, first degree black belt out of uh, Magic BJJ in Lansing, Michigan, and we are under Chris Hodder under the combat based flag. I will be 51 years old this coming summer. And I've had the opportunity through BJJ Mental Models to reach out, to reach a lot of older grapplers in their 40s, 50s, and beyond, and help talk about things like ways you should train, techniques that might work better for the older grappler, like the mindset. There's a premium series that you and I did that's on the premium channel. I've done traveled and done some seminars lately, and I've been really enjoying that. And yeah, is that that's what you wanted, I think? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's probably a good thing to mention that, you know, this is not your first rodeo here. You've uh, been on the podcast before with us many times. In fact, you were with us on the public feed to talk about old bastard jujitsu quite a while ago. I'll dig up the exact episode number there and put that in the show notes, because that way, if anyone listens to this and it resonates with them, then we can, you know, they'll have more to listen to. Uh, Actually, it was episode 191. So if people are listening to this and want a kind of a broader conversation about how to grapple as you get older look uh, for episode 191 i'll also put a link in the show notes and like you said yeah we did a whole five part premium course on the game plan for old bastards like ourselves in jujitsu and that's on bjj mental models premium i guess we should probably add the disclaimer of course that we use the word bastard tongue-in-cheek this is a a unisex non-gendered approach there's nothing specifically male about it basically anyone can use this approach right we're ultimately talking about general strategies for older grapplers and that includes really anyone as long as they're you know old enough that they basically have to kind of worry about their bowel movements if you fall into that bucket then probably this is applicable content for you i think far too much about those things <laughs> <I know>. <laughs> <laughs> well hey man let's talk about this specifically today let's carve out a conversation about injury prevention so like I mentioned, I've got a ton of questions and comments from listeners recently that kind of fall into this bucket, which is, hey, I'm older or maybe I already have injuries. You know, my movement is impeded and I'm concerned about either aggravating them or I'm concerned about getting new injuries. And really, I just want to stay safe. But I also still want to be effective, right? I, You know, you don't want to just go in there and avoid injuries and be completely ineffective. You want to be injury free in a way where you can still grapple efficiently and effectively and get results. And so with that said, I mean, maybe give me an update. Just talk about yourself here. I mean, I know that you, of course, as an older guy, you've had your own battles with injuries, but maybe give me a little bit of context in terms of how you know all of this stuff and where that info is derived from. Oh, well, the first disclaimer is I'm not a doctor, right? I'm a social worker. So I don't have medical training, but I have a lot of medical issues. <laughs> yeah, like you said, you know, I'm 
I'm in my early 50s, so there's all the wear and tear on the body that comes with that. I've been doing martial arts and combat sports since I was 14 years old, consistently, like not a year on here, a year off there. Like I have not, other than being off the mat injured, I've not not trained martial arts since I was 14. So that's a long time of wear and tear on my body. Plus about, oh, 15, 16, 14 years ago-ish, I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, which even though it's got the name arthritis, there's kind of a movement to call it rheumatoid disease because it's an autoimmune disease that typically the first symptoms are joint related. Like you get joint pain, you get degradation of cartilage and basically just wrecks your joints, right? Causes a lot of inflammation and it can also cause issues with your organs, you know, other organs. I have some co-occurring conditions as well. I've got glaucoma, which if untreated can make you lose your eyesight, but that's related to all the inflammation and stuff like that. So I definitely have to worry about staying healthy on the mat. And I am, I was having conversations with people about this this past weekend, even before you reached out to me and asked if I wanted to do this episode, you know, I have to be careful when I'm training because sometimes I'm just more fragile than I would like to be. So a lot of my training is geared toward making sure I'm healthy enough to come train the next day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I think that aspect is under considered, especially for people who are early on in their journey. And, you know, one thing that, man, if I had a time machine and I could go back and talk to the 20, 25 year old version of myself, one thing I would be very careful and consistent about explaining is to make sure that you think about these things. You know, there you don't want to just think about the class that you're in today and what you want to do today and whether you're going to win or lose in the gym. You need to be thinking about long term. How am I going to be able to stay in this game as long as I possibly can and avoid the kinds of things that could take me off the mats? Getting better is, I mean, yeah, you know, on the show here, we talk about a lot of tactics and strategies you can use to accelerate your learning and get results. But honestly, the big thing is consistency. And one of the most uh, obvious and uh, common ways that you can screw up your ability to be consistent is by racking up a lot of injuries. That takes you out of the game. So this is something that I know a lot of younger grapplers especially struggle with is they they just don't want to take even a moment off of jujitsu to recover. They just always want to be training. And sometimes they're kind of, you know, trading some short-term wins at some long-term costs where maybe they're they're doing things in the class that are going to reduce their longevity, which you never want to do in a sport like jujitsu. Oh God, no, 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 not, not at all. Like I, I consider, I think one of the important things to consider when it comes to injury prevention is your recovery is part of your training. Like that, that is not taking a break from training. That's part of your training. So making sure that your sleep is good, that your, you know, diet is healthy, that you have days off the mat, off of jujitsu, that's part of it. So I try to remind myself when, you know, oh, it's a day off of jujitsu today. And yeah, I'd really love to be on the mats, but this is like part of it for me. This is part of the lifestyle. This is part of making sure I can continue to do this as I keep getting older. So I don't think of recovery and training as two separate things. They're two sides of the same coin, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. And like we mentioned earlier, such a big part of this is uh, if you want to continue to advance your skill and particularly if you want to be a competitor and you want to achieve your competitive goals, you have to remain consistent. Yes. And if you continuously try to train through stupid situations that are going to cost you later, you know, I don't know if that's a good thing. I don't know if it's a good idea to trade for a short-term benefit at the expense of your long-term career. And I think that's always something that especially younger grapplers need to think about when they're dealing with injuries is making sure they do the right thing to let it heal so that it doesn't nag them forever. Right. Right. No. Yeah, I totally agree with that like it's very easy you know we love jujitsu it's so much fun and it's a rush to be on the mats and we get to be with our friends and you know and let's be honest as much as people say leave your ego at the door and you know there's no ego on this mat as human beings we have ego that's just part of who we are 
And so, especially if you're a competitor, I, I'm a competitor. I, I love to compete. And yeah, my ego's wrapped up in that a little bit. Like, I, it doesn't feel good to have to take time off the mat when I'm injured or to, you know, have to slow things down when I'm, I'm ramping up for an event or something like that. But for the sake of being able to do jiu-jitsu the next day, the next week, the next month, or the next year, you've got to take care of those little things when they pop up. You know, you can't train through, especially as you get older. Like when I was, I wasn't doing jiu-jitsu back in my 20s, but I was doing other martial arts. I was doing a lot of striking. And like maybe I'd train through some stuff in my late teens, early 20s, even early 30s, but you can't get away with that, especially as you get older. Like it comes back to bite you in the rear end. Yeah. Yeah. And there's also just the aspect of life priorities. And in addition to that, just your tolerance for these kinds of things as well, because sometimes things that happen on the mats can impact your real life, depending on your job. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you've got a job that requires some degree of movement, and you injure your your arm or your leg in such a way that it impacts your career as you get older that's something you really need to think about when you're younger you kind of just power through or don't really think about it but when you're older and you've got to balance you know family obligations with your ability to perform at work with your ability to just kind of you know be able to remain active into your later years these are things that you all start thinking about little things that you probably don't think about until you're older like i mean you know Something I never thought about until I had a kid is, look, I've got to make sure that I am in a physical state where I can move fast enough to run after and chase and catch my kid (laughs) if she's up to something that we know that she shouldn't be doing. Like if she gets excited and runs into traffic or something, I've got to make sure I can move my ass fast enough to go get her. And these kinds of things start to eclipse other things as priorities when you start to get older, right? And so as you get older, most people tend to have reduced tolerance for injuries on the jujitsu mats. And I think that that's something that honestly, the youngins would probably be wise to listen to their elders on and to adopt that mindset earlier in their journey rather than later. Yeah, I completely agree. I just happened to have attended a seminar with Coach Chris, Chris Hodder, this past Friday at our sister school in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And one of the first things he said when the event started was that his number one goal at every training session is to not get injured, to leave healthy enough to be able to do it again the next day. And that's the lens that he's looking at his jujitsu through. And he's just a few years older than me. He's not actually that much older than I am. I think he said he was 58. He still grumbled that he was the oldest person in the room, (laughs) which was kind of funny. But he, you know, he said that's his main goal is to leave the mat uninjured. And, you know, that really resonates with me because, you know, you love this sport and you want to do it all the time. And, you know, you get jacked up and you can't do it the next day. And when when you're older, it takes you so much longer to recover. So every time I go in to train, I went and trained this morning. We had an open mat and my first goal was to leave uninjured. And there's different aspects to that, I think. You know, the first aspect is picking your training partners. I am very picky about who I actually roll with live. I don't pick training partners based on who I think I can beat. I pick them based on who's going to take care of me and make sure I don't get hurt to the best of their ability. Right. Like we know accidents do happen. This is a combat sport, right? It's impossible to, I think we'd both be lying to your listeners if we said, oh, you know, train at this, this kind of school, that kind of school, you'll never get injured. I think that's a fallacy that you, you know, I chuckle when people say the gentle art jiu-jitsu. I'm like, oh, look at my body. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I pick training partners on like, who do I trust? Who, who can I trust when I'm in a compromised position? Because I don't care what rank you are, how good you are. Most average practitioners, you know, you're going to roll some people that are going to tie you up, right? And you have to make sure that you can trust them when that happens, right? So I won't roll with the new guy, the the 22-year-old musclehead new guy coming in, right? Not until I get to know them. Not until they've had, you know, 
few weeks, a few months, maybe to kind of understand how to move their body through space, right? And and realize that every role isn't a fight necessarily. That's that's what that's what the young black belts are for. <laughs> you know, I, I I'm not the mat enforcer anymore. You know, like that's not my goal. That's not my job. So I cherry pick my training partners, and you know, I, of course, I want to train with people that give me a challenge and help make me better but not at the expense of wrecking my body. Cause I'm not going to get better if I'm off with an injury. Yeah, definitely. I would expand on that too and say, it's not always just about training partners, but it is also about making sure that you select the right training environment as well. Yes. If you are in an environment where the coach doesn't prioritize safety, then you're likely that probably going to rack up more injuries than if you train at a place where they do. Now, the granted, that isn't to say that one approach is necessarily always better than the other. I mean, if you are training at a hyper competitive gym and your goal is to be the best in the world, you might have a different tolerance for this stuff and you might have different needs from your instructor. But I can tell a story of my own that kind of sounds similar to the one you talked about there with Chris. <laughs> One of the first instructors I trained with, you know, his goal was he wanted to get his students at the top of the podium. He was very excited about competition results. That was his priority. And I just never really resonated with that. I mean, for me, I train jujitsu as a purely as a hobby. I don't compete at all, right? I just do it for fun. Mm -hmm. It's just a way to blow off steam, get exercise, network, meet some people, see my friends. I don't want to go out there and risk getting getting hurt. I switched gyms and then my my next instructor, he gave a kind of one of a mat chat speech to everyone in the room one day and he said that his goal was to get you deep into this career without suffering any serious injuries. And that really stuck with me, that that would be the instructor's number one goal, right? Not producing trained killers, not getting a bunch of gold medals they can advertise on their website, but rather just preventing injuries was his number one goal. Because, like he said, you know, the goal here is consistency. Injuries are sort of, in a lot of ways, the antithesis of consistency. So what do you do here if you want to keep people consistent? You keep them injury free. And to me, that was kind of a formative moment that the instructor would prioritize that around and above everything else. And if I had stayed at the old environment where, you know, injury prevention was a lower priority, I probably would have wound up on a much different path right? <laughs> with a lot more crippling, nagging problems than I have right now. So I think that it, it can go sometimes beyond just finding the right partners, but also finding the right gym where they're aligned with you on goals, uh, particularly safety being one of them. Yeah, actually, yes, of course. I'm really glad that you you brought that up. I think sometimes I've been at our gym since day one of its inception, right? I am not the owner. I never want to own a gym ever. <laughs> I couldn't imagine that kind of responsibility. And, you know, I'm afraid gym ownership would make jujitsu into work for me, which then would just ruin the fun, right? But I've been there since day one and have been part of the group that kind of sets the culture. So I sometimes forget that there's other cultures that, you know, might not fit my needs or fit, you know, or jive with what, what I want to get out of jiu-jitsu, right? And one of the things I tell people was that, you know, for me, I would rather train, if I had the choice between this gym full of world-class competitors, but can I swear on this podcast? <laughs> you absolutely can. <laughs> but they're a bunch of assholes, right? That I don't trust, that aren't safe. Or a gym full of pretty good average hobbyists that I trust with my life. I'll train with the, the second gym forever, right? Because I think I'm, I'm going to be there longer. I'm going to be there. I'm going to get more out of it because I'm going to want to go more. I'm going to have more fun at it. And like having fun at this sport equates wanting to stick with it for a long time, which becomes consistency, which gets you better at it. So 100%, like, I would much rather train with the mediocre people who I trust than the, the killers that I don't. You know, luckily, I feel like we have a lot of killers that I trust, but again, I'm biased, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's dig in a little bit deeper here. I mean, you mentioned that one of the most important ways to prevent injuries is to find the right environment where people are aligned with you. So that means mm -hmm. training partners that you can trust, a gym with a matching culture. What else should a grappler look for here if their goal is to stay as injury-free as possible throughout this journey? So what I tend to do is I tend to, and okay, I'm speaking as an experienced grappler. 
uh, and this may not resonate with somebody brand new, but we can talk about what somebody brand new might do in a second. But as a more experienced grappler, I change on a case by case, session by session basis, I change my strategy based on who I'm rolling with in order to keep myself safe. Case in point, rolling with a newer white belt that I've never rolled with before. Okay. So first of all, I never roll with a brand new white belt that just walks in the room unless like, I mean, there's always exceptions to this rule, but I typically, oh, you, this is your first week here. I'm not rolling with you. I'm going to give it to the young purple belt that when you spaz out on them, you're probably not going to tweak their knee or, you know, twist their elbow wrong, right? Or whatever. But when I'm rolling with somebody with less experience than me, I'm usually on the defensive, meaning I'm very unlikely to put myself in any situations where I'm more likely to get hurt. And that could mean either if I end up on bottom, everything is kept tight and I'm not taking any major risks to try to escape until I 100% am sure that it's going to happen. Or if I'm on top, I'm not relinquishing any control. I'm not playing loose with this person until I completely know that I can trust them. And that's learned from experience. I've made that mistake before rolling with the bigger, newer, younger guy who I was letting, quote unquote, letting him work. And I got into a superior position and he kind of panicked and made this violent movement. And next thing you know, I've torn an MCL in my knee because of said violent movement. So, you know, if I don't know you super well, I'm playing super defensive at the outset. Not, I don't care if you tap me, but I care more about be defending against injury. Is that, does that, do you understand what I mean by that? Absolutely. Absolutely. We've talked about this mental model on the show in the past that I've always just called limb coiling, right? Trying to keep your limbs kind of inside the vehicle at all times, keep your arms and legs and even your head sort of semi-retracted and, and not to leave them dangling. If you take a look at when people get injured, one of the patterns you'll probably observe is that injuries happen when a limb is left dangling. Yep. It is hard to get injured when everything is tight and compact. Now that said, being tight and compact all the time is is just not feasible, right? If you right. are if you stay completely coiled all the time, you're basically going to be curled up in a ball and never move. So you can't entirely grapple that way, or at least most people can't. I sort of can, but most people can't. <laughs> right. The infamous turtle. Yeah, notorious turtle player over here. But the reality is to get anything going, you need to extend something. So you're always constantly having this battle of, okay, should I retract my limbs or should I extend my limbs? If you extend things, then that's how you can generate power. It's how sometimes you can, you know, get distance with your frames, but you're also giving your opponent something that they can latch onto. If I stick my arm out straight at you, now I got to worry about arm drags or depending on the position, even getting my arm snapped, right? And not even in mm -hmm. a submission. Sometimes just if you zig and I zag, you can hyperextend my elbow. So what I often advise people to do is, especially when you're at the early stages, if all other things are equal, and you don't really know what you want to do in any given moment in the match. And this is very common, especially when you're new, right? You're just in there like, mm -hmm. a, with, like a deer with their eyes in the headlights, right? You don't know what's going to happen. You don't have a plan. In those situations, I generally tell people your default should be try to retract everything. Think of a boxer, right? They always tell a boxer like your default stance should be chin down, hands up work on your foot movement, right? Same thing in jujitsu. If you don't have a better plan or a better opportunity, you can't see what you need to do here. You want to stay defensive, coil everything in by default. You only extend something if number one, it actually serves a purpose. Like don't just stick an arm out there for no reason. You only want to do it because it, you're trying to generate some force or do a technique or something, but also only do it in a situation where you know you can do it safely. So there are some techniques, for example, where it's totally fine and totally safe to stiff arm your opponent because they don't have an easy way to grab your arm. Mm -hmm. But there's other situations where it's a bad idea to stiff arm your opponent because they can just latch onto your arm and 
do something, right? So I always tell people your default should be coiling your limbs. And that is very important for safety because if everything is tight and compact, it's much harder to get injured because your opponent can't latch onto anything, right? I mean, unless they pick you up and body slam you, there's not that much they can do to hurt you from there. So for me, I've always found that strategy of coiling up and staying defensive by default to be a just a key concept for injury prevention in jiu-jitsu. Yeah, d- definitely. Like if I'm, I won't let myself be moved unless I want to move, especially if I'm rolling with somebody that I don't know all that well yet. And, you know, I don't, don't know if I can open up safely, you know? So yeah, for sure. For sure. So yeah, I guess that does, that's a good strategy, no matter what level of a grappler you are. I mean, a day one grappler is not going to know to do that, but hopefully the day one grappler is an environment where their coaches are going to make sure that their first few lessons are completely safe and that they're taken care of. Because when you're that new, it's got to be on the coaches to take care of you. You you can't, yeah. you know, as you get more experience, you can start, like, you understand how to take care of yourself and not get get hurt. But when you're a little baby grappler, you need the coach to help you out with that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I also, like, I can't see this enough. Who gives a rat's ass if you get tapped? It's another injury strategy. Don't be afraid to tap to anybody, no matter what, right? Like... I actually tapped to some pressure last week because I like had an old rib injury that has decided to rear its head. And I was like, you know what? I'd like to be able to train tomorrow. So let's tap and let's go to another position and continue the roll because <laughs> that really sucks. So like don't don't be afraid to tap to anybody, right? We all we all talk about leave your ego off the mat and, you know, leave your ego at the door and all the other sayings, but because we're human beings and because we like to measure things and we sometimes are like, oh, well, that person's a lower rank than me or, you know, I'm the coach and I shouldn't be tapped by a blue belt or a purple belt or whatever. But that's that, especially as you get older, that leads to injury, right? So there's no winning a, a role in the gym. Okay, so the the gym is a place to experiment, to learn, to try to make yourself better. And part of that is getting caught and and learning to tap without any shame. So just do it because nobody's going to remember the next day or the next week who tapped you or or what, you know, or who tapped who or whether they saw you get tapped out or not. No one's going to care. Well, I would add too. moreover. In the gym, your goal should not, like you said, it's not to win, it's to learn. And, you know, if you're deep in a submission, right? And you think maybe if you power your way out, there's like a, you know, a 50% chance that you'll get out, but a 50% chance you'll get stuck and maybe get injured. That's not really a great trade, right? Especially in the gym where your goal is to learn. I have been very stubborn in the past about not tapping from stupid things. And it's always a bad idea. Notable examples. I was caught in a triangle one time didn't tap because it didn't feel like I was, you know, it was tight, but it didn't feel like I was going to go unconscious. Yeah. So I was just kind of hanging out in there for a minute. And then all of a sudden my opponent freaked out and let it go and, and asked me if I was okay. And I thought, what do you mean? I feel fine. And then he said, your face, man, what's wrong with your face? So I get up and I take a look in the mirror. Every blood vessel in my face is burst. <laughs> Like I, I, I'm like permanently red for a few days now because I was, I probably did a bunch of brain damage to myself too. I can't oh, imagine no. this is a good thing. That's why you started a podcast because of the brain damage. That's why, that's why this shit is audio only. I don't want people to see what I look like. <laughs> but beyond that too, the other, the other thing is just, you know, another example. I remember one time I was sparring with a, a black belt and he got me into that awful, like belly down back mount position, you know, where you're oh. flattened out on the bottom. Yep. And I thought, well, I, I'm just going to be stubborn here. I mean, I, I'm screwed, but I'm just going to be stubborn. And I just tried to like not tap and, you know, cover my face. And this guy just started grinding his gi fabric across my face, right? To try to, oh. to open me up, which he succeeded at doing. But unfortunately, I looked all screwed up for days after. Like I had to go to the office looking like I'd been in a bar fight afterwards oh. because I just wouldn't tap. So this is an area where I disagree with a lot of the people who say you should never tap to pressure, right? I mean, first of all, you've got guys like Gordon Ryan out there getting pressure taps. So, you know, don't tell me this stuff doesn't work at the highest levels, even at the highest levels, people will pressure tap. But beyond that, you don't know 
what the other person's life goals and situation is when when they're training, right? They might have a medical situation. So if you're in there and from a cultural standpoint, you're telling your students that, you know, if you tap from pressure, you're weak, you're encouraging students to to avoid tapping well beyond the point of safety. Yep. I mean, yes, it is true. You don't want to cultivate a mindset where your students just tap to anything, right? And they don't take the time to try to defend. You do want people to work their defenses and to not give up too quickly, for sure. But you also have to understand that people, first of all, you know, there's a point of diminishing returns at trying to avoid tapping in the gym, right? There's really not that much benefit in trying to tough it out in a friendly gym role. But beyond that, you don't know what the person's life goals are. You don't know what their priorities are, right? You're in there and you do something stupid and you injure the person. You might have taken away their ability to work and make money and provide for their family now, right? And so there's kind of two sides to this coin. One side is making sure you don't do something stupid to your training partner. But the other thing is not drinking the Kool-Aid that Tapping is a bad idea if you're not caught in a submission, right? This is very common dogma in jujitsu. Don't tap from pressure. Don't tap from pressure. Look, tap for any reason that you feel is valid. If you don't feel safe anymore, tap. That's what I always say. Yes. I've trained with people who have tapped because the match went out of bounds and they were just afraid that, you know, you go out of bounds and there can be a safety issue. And then that's fine, right? uh, No one's counting wins. You just reset back in the middle of the room. It's not a big deal. But people put way too much emphasis on racking up wins in the gym. And that's really a bad strategy. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. Uh, Yeah. I I mean, I've tapped recently, you know, to that pressure, like I said, because... I was like, oh, my rib is starting to hurt again. I'm not not going to deal with this. You know, we could just continue the friendly role. We could just continue the role. I, I tapped and said, hey, you know, this is going on. Let's just switch positions slightly and just keep playing. Right. OK, cool. You know, no big deal. Mm-hmm. I've tapped. I have. We're talking about preventing injuries. I'm listing all my recent injuries. Right. I had a knee injury at the beginning of the year. And so. Since I've healed enough, you know, I had to take a couple, three weeks off the mat and ease back into it. I've tapped when my knee's in a weird spot. I'm like, yeah, I don't quite like this. Let's, you know, I'd like to be able to walk. I got to teach, you know, I'm starting to teach seminars all over the place now, thanks to you. And so like, I don't want to wreck that. Like if I get injured, I can't go teach this thing or I can't do X, Y, and Z. So, you know, and I've, I've racked up injuries in the past from not tapping too and i would also say not just not tapping but like get not how do i want to put this i have been injured in the past by not giving up on a position long before it was time to give up on it case in point as a blue belt i was in the gym refusing to let this guy open my full guard right i was clamped down to like my life depended on it and you know if i have to be honest i was nearing the end of blue belt getting close to purple and i thought you know i'm almost a purple belt i can't let this guy tap my you know pass my guard you know whatever i ended up getting my left adductor tendon torn off my hip bone because i refused to open my guard and this guy was dead set on passing what would have happened if I just opened my guard and he would have even passed? We would have just had a fun rest of the match and I would have got home that night uninjured. Yeah. But instead, I, I'm i the only person who have been taken out of her gym by ambulance because I couldn't walk. Oh, man. <laughs> was, yeah. We were in a basement at the time, a basement uh, commercial location and old crappy building and the elevator was broke so the paramedics had to hoist me on the gurney up the steps it was awesome but that sounds lovely it was lovely but in hindsight why didn't i just open my guard right like i was long past the point of being effective with my guard i was doing nothing but holding on to position that i was busy losing right why did i not open my guard and try to do something else you know even if i got past it was because i was too stubborn to you know to do that my ego got involved and i'll never do something like that again like i it was an awful way to learn that lesson but i've never held on well i mean not never but like i I won't hold on to positions for longer than than i need to you know always ready to transition to the next thing especially if it's starting to feel unsafe right yeah yeah this this knowledge of knowing when it's time to let go of something 
is a critical aspect of jujitsu maturity. And it's not just a white belt problem. I, I've sparred with a lot of even purple belts who make this mistake where they hold on to something well past the point of it being useful. And when you do that, you know, if you're like you said, if you're still trying to retain guard, for instance, when there is a just a minuscule possibility of that actually happening. First of all, you could wind up putting your body in an awkward position where injuries can happen. But mm -hmm. beyond that, if you're getting too myopic about it, you might be closing your mind to other possibilities that might make more sense at that point. There's a tipping point with certain moves and positions where after it gets past a certain threshold, what your opponent wants to happen is probably going to happen. And you just, you're not going to be able to stop them using that tactic anymore. And you got to switch it up. And the issue that a lot of people have is they get really myopic and they're still trying to hold on to it. I mean, you know, think of like white belts that are still trying to headlock a person when they're on bottom side control, right? It's a completely yes. pointless thing. You're well past the tipping point there. You know, the person has completely dominated and moved past the position. There's no benefit now to continuing to hold on to their head. In fact, you're just exposing your arm for injury. But similar things to what you described have happened to me too. I remember one time I was sparring with a black belt and I was really intent on retaining guard mm -hmm. when, you know, I, I was probably going to get past and I tried to do a, a high leg, you know, where you throw your top leg over to try to recover guard. But I did it at an angle that was kind of outside of my body's regular movement range. And I tweaked my knee and that was, yes. that was on me, right? That was because I tried to move my body in an awkward way because I didn't like where the match was taking me and I wanted to try to force things in a different direction. And it was too late to do so. We were past that tipping point. So learning when to let go of something is a critical bit of jujitsu maturity. And it's also critical not just for injury prevention, but also just to avoid making dumb mistakes. You know, the right. example I gave earlier, people who try to headlock you from bottom side control, you do that. And even if you don't get injured, you probably will get arm locked. <laughs> right. So it's not a good idea one way or the other. You got to learn when it's time to move on to something else, especially when you're on the defensive. Right. And even, I would say, even in competition, right? I mean, we're doing a lot of talking about, about hobbyist jiu-jitsu, which is by far the hobbyist community far outnumbers the competitor community and then the far even by more so far outnumbers the like elite competitor community which i am in nowhere near like the elite competitor community right but like even in competition you got to know when to let something go when something is when it's past its prime when you've reached that tipping point because it, you don't want to get hurt in competition either i'll admit live on the air that last year at, at Master Worlds in Vegas, I had one match and I lost by sub. And the guy was doing like a paper cutter choke, right? A bread, you know what I mean? Like from top side control and I was on the bottom, stuck underneath him. Was it a paper cutter or I can't remember what. We had my gi and he was choking and it wasn't choking me. Like it wasn't around my carotids, but it was cranking the bejesus out of my jaw and neck. And I was not getting out. Like I could not improve my position. So I tapped and it went through my mind very clearly like, okay, I'm not getting choked and this is master world, but you know what? I can't get out from this position. And if I try to survive this, it's just going to end up hurting my jaw and neck. And I really don't want to leave Vegas with a broken jaw. <laughs> so this guy's got the better of me. He wins. It's the, he's, he's a better grappler today. Like I, I can't get out. There's no disrespect meant to this gentleman if he, I don't even know who he is. If he hears this, it was a great match. You won fair and square. The choke wasn't in, but I wasn't going anywhere and I would have gotten hurt. So you know what? I'm tapping. I'm going to enjoy the rest of my time in Vegas. Yeah. That ability to know when there's no point in trying to fight anymore is super critical. Knowing when, okay, realistically, no matter how hard I fight, I'm done here, right? There isn't a realistic way that I can get out, or maybe the chances of me getting out are really small, but the chances of me getting injured if I try to fight this are really big. That's a bad trade, right? And right. learning to kind of do that mental math <laughs> and, and not making those bad trades is a critical part to staying on the mat for the long term. Right, right. Oh, exactly. And you know what? I, it was fine. I didn't beat myself up for losing that one match. Like he obviously, he won fair and square and he was by far the better grappler that day and i enjoyed two or three more days in vegas with my team and friends and it was great you know i didn't have to suck smoothies through a wired shut jaw 
It was perfect. <laughs> it was a good time. <laughs> so yeah, like like knowing when to give stuff up and knowing when to tap and not being ashamed to do it is a huge piece of not getting injured on the mats. You know, and then I would also say another thing that I think is super important is not overtraining, you know, because when we, it's it's been shown that that overtraining reduces your body's ability to recover. It reduces your immune system's ability to fight off infections. And, and it's so easy to overtrain in jujitsu, right? It, because it's so much fun. And we always want that one more role, you know? We always want that, oh, that one last, one last match at the open mat or, you know, one more role at the end of class. And so many times I personally have done that one last role when I'm already exhausted and then something gets tweaked or I get injured. And so one thing that I'm working on is, for myself, is leaving training with something left in the tank. Not every session should not be, you know, to the end of my reserves where I can barely walk off the mat, you know, especially as I get older. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny because we all know that one of the, you know, one of the things that everyone preaches in jujitsu is growth from discomfort and the idea that Mm -hmm. if you want to grow, you have to push outside of your comfort zone. And that's true, but it's a bit of a science. It's very possible to push outside of your comfort zone too far. Yes. And in fact, you probably have actually worked with this concept, this idea of the zone of proximal development, right? You want to push yourself outside of your comfort zone and challenge yourself a certain amount, but not too much, right? Because I mean, look, while it's true that yes, we grow from discomfort, you know, jumping off a cliff is very uncomfortable. That doesn't mean that you should all jump off of a cliff because it's uncomfortable. There's a limit, right? There's a point at which too much discomfort is damaging. And so there's that magic sweet spot where you're pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone such that you're learning and you're growing, but not so much that you're taking on risk to yourself. And that's kind of something that I think people always need to be balancing, right? It's easy to fall into this trap of of comfort where you, you get into a routine and you're not doing different things anymore and you're not growing. But you also want to avoid being reckless where you're taking you're doing so many risky things that it's going to come back and bite you most likely at some point. So I'd say that there's some mental math that we all have to do if we want to remain in the game for a long time here. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, for sure. I completely, completely agree. And like that, that also ties into my training schedule is I'm usually training jujitsu four days a week, four times a week. That seems to be pretty optimal for me. And then I've got two days of strength training a week. I'm working out at my age, six days a week, but I have to be very disciplined I have to discipline myself and make sure that I do four days of jiu-jitsu and two days of strength training. Because strength training also is really important for me in order to stay injury-free. Because, like, muscle is my armor against injury. Like, I'm not trying to get buff and shredded because, you know, I mean, I'm married already. I don't need to attract anybody (laughs) else, right? (laughs) So, you know, I'm not trying to get buff and shredded. I'm trying to stay injury-free and be able to stay on the mats. And it takes some discipline to do that because I'd much rather be rolling. <laughs> like I, I lift weights and I kind of enjoy it. But the only reason I do it is so I can stay healthy for jujitsu. And I found in the past when I start skipping those days for some extra jujitsu training, that's when I really get hurt. That's when the, the shit hits the fan for me is like I've totally lost track of that that very important piece of conditioning off the mats and I just get rolled up doing jiu-jitsu five, six, seven days a week for a month, two months, three months, and then bam, something gets hurt. So like not only do I have to be smart enough to temper my training like on days when I'm training jiu-jitsu and not overdo it then, but I have to be smart enough to stay disciplined and be like, you know what? Today's not a jiu-jitsu day. Today's a recovery day or today's a, a weightlifting day. And that's what, what it's going to be. And I'm not going to give in to that temptation to just do what's fun and gives like the immediate, immediate reward of getting to roll. Because if I do that enough, I'm going to be off, right? I'm going to get hurt and I'm going to be off. Right, right. Makes sense. That's really hard. That's hard because it's just so fun. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, hey, we've talked a lot about kind of big ideas here, just general overall concepts, but I'm sure people out there are going to want to hear specifics from us. So mm-hmm. are there any specific things that you do or don't recommend? Like don't play this position, don't use that technique. Is there anything that granular that we could provide as general advice or is it too dependent on the scenario? No, I don't think it's dependent on the scenario. I think your fundamental Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu movements and techniques are going to be what's going to keep you the safest on the mat. And by fundamental, I mean things like having good base and having good posture and having good alignment and techniques that have the fewest, how do I want to say this? I know what I mean. How do I want to put it in words? The fewest moving parts and the least explosive movement are going to be the best. And granted, I'm biased, but that's basically old bastard jiu-jitsu yeah, yeah. right there. All other things being considered equal, you should choose the technique with the fewest moving parts. It's uh, Mahaffey's razor. That's, yeah. Oh my God. That's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Yeah, but, but, but basically it's true. Like I'm not doing inversions and barambolos, right? And I'm still fairly athletic for a 51 year old Uh, it could be better i don't know you should see i limp a lot after training but that's i've had ra for 15 years so whatever right but like i don't do those techniques and it's not because i don't think they're cool or would be fun but there's too big a risk of injury for me and i feel like i can get the same results out of something with fewer moving parts and less explosive movement And that's going to keep me safer on the mat and still achieve the same objective, right? So your fundamentals are where it's at. And as students of the art, I think we should always be sharpening our fundamentals. Like if from this day forward, I don't learn any new techniques at all in jiu-jitsu, that'd be fine with me because I'm still not as good at the fundamentals as I would like to be, right? And those are going to be what, I can carry through with me into my 60s and 70s and 80s, hopefully, you know, the universe willing that I can keep training that long. And it's going to be, those are going to be the things that are going to have the least likelihood of me getting hurt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is actually something that just recently Rafael Lovato Jr. talked about on the podcast here. I haven't listened to that episode, so. Oh, you should. It was a good one. I'm happy to be of the same, having the same thought process as uh, somebody like that. Well, the big thing that he always pushes is this idea of timeless jujitsu techniques that you can work on and build upon for your entire career and always get better at. The problem with a lot of techniques is if they're, you know, if they're trendy and you're chasing the meta, they might lose their effectiveness as soon as people kind of catch on. Or maybe the techniques are just kind of dependent on a young, athletic, limber body type that either a lot of people don't have or even for the people who do have they will lose it eventually right those kinds of attributes right. don't stay with you forever whereas if you focus on good foundational timeless fundamentals that kind of stuff is probably always going to be relatively safe i would just also expand on this that you know we were talking about retracting and extending your limbs i generally find that whenever you're leaving a a limb and I include your head in this, it's not really a limb, but whenever you're leaving, I guess a lever dangling, like your head, your arm, your legs, you know, the rest of your body is kind of moving in one direction, but you left something behind and your opponent grabs it. That's often when injuries happen. So you have to be very careful when you leave any of your levers exposed. And some techniques do this more than others. As an example, if I, I'm just trying to think of a a good one here, right? If I put you in a rear naked choke, there's not a lot of stuff that I'm leaving exposed there, right? Right. I, I can be relatively sure that I can do this technique safely. If on the other hand, we're talking about like a barambolo, I have to, at some point, push out and extend my legs and rotate my body. There's a lot of things that are happening all at once. You have to be very fluid and very experienced to be able to pull something like that off and make it work. And there's going to be a risk of injury, right? If you have your legs entangled with your opponent like that and you zig and they zag, bad things can happen. So that's not to say you should never do those techniques 
because clearly they work. And if your goal is to win in a competition and you're willing to accept that long term injury because the competition matters that much, well, that's that's a decision that you can make. Right. But if your goal is longevity, it's important to understand that not all techniques are created equal. If you're leaving something extended, if you're leaving a limb behind, that's when injuries can happen, right? And often this is what happens when people get injured in scrambles is people will be kind of throwing their bodies around and they don't really know what position they're in. You leave your leg behind, your opponent sits on it, your knee snaps, right? That kind of stuff can happen. So I think that a lot of injuries probably arise from people just not having full body awareness and leaving a body part behind <laughs> yes. when they're trying to do something else. Yes. No, uh, for sure. For sure. And, you know, they're using those, like, using that thought process. You can even train, I think, more, quote unquote, dangerous techniques in a more safe manner, right? Like, we have we have a takedown class once a week at our gym. And it's run by a guy that one of our brown belts, who really should be a black belt. He should have been a black belt years and years and years ago. He just refuses. Uh, he, he's been grappling for decades. He's a little older than I am. And he runs our takedown class. And he's got ways of teaching everybody takedowns in a manner that, I mean, nobody's been hurt in his class, right? We have a zero injury record because of the way he does it. And when we do our stand-up, sparring we don't necessarily do it it's not like okay two people in the ring and you just go until somebody's smashed and thrown to the ground right he's got limited win conditions that he's set up like you win if you get double underhooks you win if you grab a leg right if you get a leg off the ground you win if you can get the front headlock you win if you can end up on their back you know and you don't necessarily have to take somebody down so it's doing what is really a much more dangerous like because we let's be honest takedowns are way more dangerous than just laying down on the ground and rolling around and wrestling with each other right there's a lot more things that can go wrong your limbs are if you're standing on your feet your limbs are already extended away from your center right but if you limit those like wind conditions for the live training you can get a ton out of it with very little injury and the results are there too. Like we got a lot of, a lot of people that like to compete at our gym and we're known at this point for being the gym that takes people down. We have people like pulling guard on us. <laughs> Nobody wants to stand anymore, right? With our team. So, and it's done very safely. So I think if you can do these, these kind of motions and maybe kind of limit your, your quote unquote win conditions, you can still get something out of it without as big a risk of somebody getting hurt. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that what you're talking about there, it's kind of like a constraints based approach, right? right? Where you're, you're altering the rules of the game so that you're removing the things that could potentially lead to injury and could reduce training time, but you're leaving in the things that are realistic and helpful for training. And you're also taking away the the mental requirement of people to kind of have that kill instinct where they're trying to win, right? If the goal is different, then people aren't likely to do the same thing. That's why I really like those gamified approaches where you kind of create these specific games. And Because if you leave people to their own device, I mean, even if it's two experienced grapplers, you leave them to their own devices and they're both going to try to win. It's going to turn into a match at some point. Right. But if you take that out of the equation and say things like the goal is to win a grip fight and when you win the grip fight, you reset. Or to take your example, the goal is to get underhooks. And when you do that, you win and you reset. That turns it less into a fight and more into a collaborative drilling game. And that is probably going to be better, not just for injury prevention, but also for skill development, because you're giving people more targeted reps at doing the thing that actually matters. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, if if this approach could get me comfortable and enjoying takedowns, then it could get anybody comfortable during takedowns. Trust me. I was terrified of takedowns. <laughs> <laughs> well, takedowns are scary, right? I mean, one of the beautiful things about jujitsu and probably one of the reasons it's so effective for casual grapplers is because... It is a totally valid strategy to deny your opponent the ability to move, right? I don't need to have the greatest cardio in the world if I can tie you in a pretzel and prevent you from moving. That's a valid strategy. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you look at judo, especially the stand-up side, so much of it is about 
getting your opponent moving, right? Getting that Kazushi so that you can throw them. And when things are moving fast and furious, it's harder for you to put on the brakes and prevent an injury. You, you don't always have the same kind of bodily control when you're flying through the air at 100 kilometers an hour, right? So, right, right. Yeah, so that is one reason why I think jujitsu is so appealing to people like us is because you can slow it down and you can make the game be safer if you so choose. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Nice. Well, hey, Mike, that's a lot of good stuff here. I got notes on this. I'm going to actually send these out. But uh, just to to recap, to go through kind of the big pointers that you had and tell me if I missed anything or if Mm -hmm. there's anything else that you wanted me to bring up. Number one, pick your training partners in gym. That's such a key part to injury prevention is having the right people to train with and the right environment to train in. Number two, changing your safety strategy per opponent. So for example, you know, if you feel unsafe coiling everything up, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to spar with people who make you feel unsafe. And if you are sparring with someone where you've got question marks, you can always kind of pull everything back in and just play safe until you know that things are okay. Mm -hmm. Number three, it's okay to tap to anything at all. There's no situation where tapping is unacceptable, regardless of what people might tell you. Number four, knowing when to give up on a position rather than holding it to the point of it becoming ineffective or dangerous. Number five, avoiding overtraining. Number six, knowing if a technique isn't for you. This is something I actually, that occurred to me, which is probably worth discussing briefly. People just have different bodies. Sometimes something might work great for 99% of grapplers, but it just might not work out for you. I mean, I've got a few moves like that where no matter how much I try them, it just doesn't feel right for my body type. Perfect example, and I think I've talked about this on the show before, is the truck. Every time I tried to do that, my knees hurt. And I just kind of realized at some point, you know what? I got enough options that I don't need to to pull out this tool that could potentially hurt my legs. I got lots of other things that I could do. So I think at some point, yes, you want to try techniques, but you also have to listen to your body. And if something doesn't feel right or feel safe, you should listen to that intuition. Yeah. I would say number seven, don't leave any levers exposed or any body parts dangling. Number eight, this kind of ties into what we talked about before regarding wind conditions, but employing smart training constraints. So making sure that you you alter the rules of the game so that the focus is on safety and skill development and not on winning in the gym. Did I miss anything or is that kind of the the big list here that you think is worth covering? No, I think that is, I can't think of anything. I had a list too, and that's everything I had as well. Great minds and all. <laughs> awesome. Well, hey, that's a pretty good list then. Anything else you wanted to bring up on the topic of injury prevention? Any closing thoughts or things you wanted to share? No, not not really. Learn from my mistakes because I've made all of them over my career, <laughs> right? Like, like I, I, none of this stuff that we talked about today am I pulling out of my rear end and making up. Like, these are all things, these are all rules that I've broken at some point in time and paid the price. So like make, if I can help, if we can help anybody who's younger or earlier on in their grappling career, no matter what age they are, like to avoid some of these, these pitfalls and do some of the things we talked about, then that's, that's time well spent in my book. So yeah, I can't think of anything else unless you can. Uh, That sounds good to me, man. Well, hey, if people want to learn more from you, of course, in episode 191, we had an amazing chat about your overall jujitsu philosophy. I do encourage that people go back and listen to that, and I'll put a link in the show notes. And of course, if people really want to dig in, you and I did a whole premium audio series on this, uh, I think over five hours long on Old Bastard Jiu-Jitsu on BJJ Mental Models Premium. So again, I'll, I'll link up to that as well. But beyond that, man, if people want to work with you or learn from you or just ask you questions, how do they go about doing that? Well, they can find me on Instagram. My name is Mike Mahaffey. You'll get about 50% jujitsu and 50% guitar stuff because my other passion hobby is uh, playing music. I'm a metalhead. So if you want to sift through the guitar to get to the jujitsu, you can find that. But you can also hit me up, PM me on there if you have any questions or concerns. And I've actually done some seminars lately which uh, blow me out of the water that people want me to come teach but if if you're interested in that you can pm me there too and we can work something out i i went down to to one of the fellow bjj mental models discord people's place down in atlanta uh, a couple weeks ago and that was a ton of fun 
and I'm going up to Ludington to uh, do one at my friend's gym in a couple weeks and been down to Mississippi to do one. So hit me up if you want that. I'd be happy to come out to your place and be an old bastard with y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I would also really recommend that, I mean, if there's any gym owners or coaches out there listening who are looking for ways that they can actually provide seminars that really offer value to their students, I would definitely suggest people consider reaching out to Mike. I think a mistake that so many gym owners make is they will try to, you know, book in someone whose specialty is high level jujitsu competition at the highest levels for 20 year olds. And that's all well and good and all. But honestly, you have to ask yourself as the instructor, are you offering that because it's the best for your students or are you offering that because you're trying to kind of like create and live out glory in your students and you're trying to steer them in a certain direction? Because if your gym is like most gyms, 90 plus percent of the people there are hobbyists, right? They want to train safely. They want to have fun. They want to get better. But look, they're not looking to devote their entire life to jujitsu competition. And so the goals of your seminar guest may not necessarily be aligned with what your students really want. I do recommend to people, you know, consider bringing in coaches who can help people with their real goals, like safety, longevity, being effective as you get older. This kind of stuff I think is underrepresented in jujitsu, which is crazy because that is the vast majority of us. So uh, if people are looking for a good seminar, I do suggest that they contact you. And again, I'll put that link to your Instagram in the show notes to make that easy. But thanks again, Mike. Yeah, thank you so much, Steve. I always appreciate you and uh, have a fun time every time we get together and chat. Absolutely, man. And hey, as always, I'll also include a link to BJJ Mental Models Premium in the show notes. If you need more Mike, that's a great place to start uh, because in addition to a whole five-part course that we did on this very topic, Mike, you're also on our rolling review team. So if anyone has rolling clips and they want to know, you know, how can I be more effective while also being safe and possibly dealing with a bunch of scrappy youngsters? <laughs> Mike is my <laughs> go-to coach for those kinds of questions. So if you fit into that profile and, you know, you're not close enough where you can go train with Mike or he's not coming to your area for a seminar soon, you can still get coaching from him by joining BJJ Mental Models Premium. So I will put the link in the show notes there as well. But Mike, man, I always love chatting with you. Thanks a lot for coming by and uh, take care of those joints, man. I will. You too, Steve. Thanks so much, my friend. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. And thanks to the listeners as always. Really do appreciate it. And we'll talk to you next week. See you soon.